Dali, Salvador Dali, is a secular humanist, realist, Renaissance European painter. Now he's at the end, at the tail end of this run, and um, so is surrealism. Of course, realism is a larger part of the concept of surrealism, which was cobbled together. Uh, by Andre Breton and his communist fellow travelers. Uh, they were a spokes, they were spokesmen for the Communist Party. Dali was only kicked out of the surrealist group when he dared make fun of Lenin in a painting. But so Dali is a product of that. There, there's no escaping that. Dali is not some sort of innovation. He is just really a part of the chain of events from Renaissance, secular humanism, realism, on up to uh, the Second World War and where it ends. This is part two of uh, the other video that I made where I spoke a little bit about the persistence of memory, which is Dali's most famous painting. The Persistence of Memory is a telling title because it talks exactly about this notion of the continuity between the Renaissance to now, or to 50, 60, 60, 70 years ago. And Dali was part of that continuity, and he was part of the persistence of that memory, the memory of the realist Renaissance concept uh, and way of thinking, which brought us science, brought us uh, printing, literature, um, and uh, a lot of, in, you know, the industrial age eventually, and a lot of the modern uh, ways of thinking that are all part of that continuum of uh, the humanistic thought. Um, the early Renaissance painters were more doctors than they were painters. They chopped up human bodies so that they could then reproduce them uh, bit by bit on a canvas. That's why Dali talks about at atomization, which is you know really just a French way of saying breaking things up into parts. Uh, it doesn't mean atomic. It means breaking things into discrete parts. It means quantum. It's actually more related to quantum. The 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 notion of atomization, atomization, uh, is a way to break things into parts, and that's the quantum approach of science, which is concerned with smashing things together, breaking them apart, and then counting the pieces, reassembling them, and making a, a Pygmalion like automaton, which they were very famous for, the, especially the uh, 17th, uh, 18th century uh, engineers were really, really fond of automatons, which is what a clock is. A clock is a, an automaton, which ticks around in a circle uh, to give us the illusion that we can control time, which is the fundamental question for science and physics, which is the notion of time, which we'll get into in another video. But in this video, we're going to talk about the reason why Dali called that the persistent memory is because it ties in with the notion of time as a quantifiable unit through watchmaking and machine making, automaton, uh, breaking things into particles in order to rebuild the particles, atomization, atomization. Uh, 
And Dali speaks of pointillism, you know, the Seurat pointillism uh, as being, you know, a perfect example of that. So we can break the painting into little dots, which really is what uh, video is, which is what photography is. Uh, this is the way that science has been able to, science and technology has been able to reproduce reality, which is the notion secular humanist realist renaissance european notion of the renaissance artist approach to reality as in a grid they would look through a grid in order to reproduce what they were painting or they would chop things up human bodies into pieces so that they could put them back together again to reproduce a reproduction of reality, which is basically where we're at now with artificial intelligence. That's another level. So Dali's persistence of memory is an important milestone in that regard. Uh, and to look at his painting, his whole painting is a timepiece, but it sort of teeters on the edge, which is that brick wall that's on the side. It teeters on the edge between the realization of time as a finite quantum and yet the notion of time as something immeasurable, which is expressed by the beach scene and the sense that before clocks, before the mechanical reproduction of time through the Renaissance engineers, time was counted through water devices or sand devices, basically, um, in order to count time, to count the passage of time. They used hourglasses or with sand in them or devices with water that would drip and that would uh, that would allow them to sort of keep time. And so this whole painting is a timepiece because it's the whole background, the whole backdrop of it is a beach. The tide is pulled out and you see these washed up watches on the sand. The translation for melted clocks is, is a, a wrong translation as Dali points out many times and uh, anyone else who actually really uh, followed his uh, philosophy knows that those are not, or anyone who can speak French knows that that's not what it means. It does not mean, Montremol does not mean melted clock. Montremol means soft watch. And since it's still, it's not melting, it's soft. It was always soft. And what he says about soft, he, he, Dali has a fascination, fascination with soft things, and in particular with mollusks. And the watch as a mollusk is a very archetypal theme, uh, sort of a clam, clamshell watch uh, is related to that but also the uh, Rolex Oyster watch was launched four years before Dali's painting. So the watch as, a, as an oyster or uh, as a clam or as some sort of mollusk, Montremol mollusk has the same word in it. A mollusk is something that's soft. It's a soft bodied creature. Montremol is a soft bodied watch, but it's a, it's a grandpa watch. It's a clamshell watch. So it's a watch as a living organism that is soft. These are washed up on the beach, which connotes the ending of time, which, which is why this painting is important, because it is the ending. This painting announces the ending of the secular, humanist, realist, European Renaissance. That is what that painting means. It's all washed up on the beach. Time is out, time is over. The mollusks are dying on the sand of time. 
One of them is caught in a dead tree. The tree is an olive tree, which represents Mediterranean civilization, but it's dead. European civilization is dying. The tree is was growing on that brick wall and obviously was starved of nutrients and thus died. The only other thing we see on the brick wall is, or stone wall, is a closed watch. This one's not soft, it's closed, it's completely closed. That watch is closed, therefore it's dead. And there's ants crawling on it, obviously attempting to get inside and eat the dead watch. And the ants, for Dali, represent collectivism, the collective mind of a hive, which is very much in keeping with communism and Nazism and these collective movements of tribal responsibility and individual lack of responsibility, the shrugging off of, of the individual responsibility onto the tribe. And that's what these ants are. And the ants feast on the skeletal remains of secular, humanistic, realistic, Renaissance thought, which again is represented by the stone wall. Um, that is essentially that painting in a nutshell, in a clamshell. The figure in the middle is Dali, obviously asleep as in a dream. And it's an anamorphic painting of Dali. He was fascinated with the Renaissance tricks of the trade, which included a lot of glass effects. He was fascinated by Vermeer and, and, and uh, the Dutch painters. And he was fascinated, of course, by the Italian Renaissance painters. And they were fascinated with glass effects. They were fascinated with mirrors. They were fascinated with mirrors, they were fascinated with glass balls. A lot of times they painted glass balls, they were fascinated with reflections because that's what they were doing. They were doing a reflection of reality. By way of a postscript, I'll just mention two things. The first is that in the upper left-hand corner of the painting, there is a mirror. Dali painted a mirror and that relates to what I said earlier about mirrors being used by the Renaissance artists. Uh, in particular, to achieve realism. The second thing has to do with the wall. One of Dali's favorite soft-bodied objects was, of course, the egg. And we all know that Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's men, all the king's horses couldn't put Humpty back together again. So, the egg falls off the wall, cracks, and the CERN Hadron Collider cannot put the egg back together again. So where does that leave us? Mm -hmm.